Hello, we are back for another week of Press Row, joined as always by Todd Walker, Aaron Matthews, Mark Kuntz. I'm Matt Finkel. Opening week for Major League Baseball. Let's talk some baseball and begin with the team in Cleveland, the Indians. What's their ceiling this year? I, you know, I think if they can keep it under control through the first month or two, get Michael Brantley healthy and producing, they can contend for the division. Their starting pitching is strong, but right now clearly the, the weakness is their, their run production. They've got to somehow the first month or two play small ball, lean on that pitching and stay close to the top and then hope that Brantley comes back not only fully healthy but fully effective and the lineup can produce a little more then. I think they're capable. They're, a lot of people have said they, they remind them of the Royals a little bit, or the Mets, I'm sorry, because they have a, a hard-throwing rotation. If you can get to the playoffs, they could be very hard to handle. Now, we'll see if the Indians are equipped to stay in it. And, uh, you know, the top of that division, Royals, Tigers, I think, should be in the fray with Kansas City, obviously the favorite. But I think Cleveland has a shot to contend. Oh, I think their ceiling is the divisional series. I, I just I, I can see them contending the entire year. I can see them getting into the postseason. I can see them winning the wild card, but I don't think they're going to get past the divisional series. I don't think they get to the championship series. I think it'll be an interesting year in Cleveland, but I, I think you're right, Todd. The offense simply is not there. We saw that on opening day. Obviously, just one game. You can't put too much stock into it, but I think there are some big question marks about the offensive production, whether that will be sustainable for an entire 162-game season. I think it's hard to, you know, determine a ceiling at this point with it only being one game in, but this team I think is going to go as far as its pitching staff and the health of its pitching staff can take it. Um, they've got to, you know, get the quality from Lindor and the other guys as well. You've got to have two through five connecting well and being consistent pitchers, not just Corey Kluber as the ace of the staff. And you mentioned Michael Brantley, Todd. I think that's a big component to the offense, but also at the same time, you got a guy like Carlos Santana who cannot hit 208 and we expect him to be productive, whether he's the DH, the first baseman, or you know, shagging fly balls in left field, he's got to be better than a 208 hitter for a season. Well, and we're also going to see if Lindor will have the sophomore right. slump or not. I, I think that's got to be a major concern for the Indians. It's such a strong rookie campaign, but all those guys are susceptible to having that step back year, that second year after they go through that full season. There's been a full year of scouting on Lindor now. That I think is another thing you have to really watch about. Yes, Carlos Santana has been a huge disappointment when you look to what we thought he could be four or five years ago. And uh, you know, they've continually tried to move him around, find a place for him, uh, first base and some DH. If he could ever find his stride, they would be very dangerous. But at this point, his track record would suggest you, you, what you see is what you get right now. If you're comparing them to the Mets, then you might figure they might have a busy July around trade deadline time if they need to boost the bats. Would, could you see that happening? Yeah, and I think, you know, obviously a, a team in a big market like the Mets has a little more room for error if they miss fire you, on you a midseason trade. You can't trade, really so. call the Mets, even though they're in New York, they haven't managed that team. Well, the, box, I, I the front that. office couldn't do it the last couple right. of years as a, as, a, as a major market team because of the restrictions they had with payroll. Yeah, moving forward though, they, they could. The Indians are always cognizant of being a small market. To make mid-season trades, you have to be very certain because most of the time what happens, you're either, you're either giving up or you're shoring up. If you're shoring up, you're probably taking on money and salary, so you'd have to really balance that with the future progression of this team. Right now, they're built on these younger guys that are coming up. If you trade for a veteran midseason, you better hope it pans out. Yeah, is there anybody in Columbus that's worth trading for if you're right. the Indians come July? What do they have to trade? That would right. be another good point. All right, let's talk about Ohio's National League team, the Cincinnati Reds. Good comeback win for the Reds in their opener. They're on again tonight. We're taping this on Wednesday. Now, can they avoid last place in the NL Central? Because the prognosticators don't have them getting out of the – the basement just got to be better than the Brewers I say it's going to come down to them and the brew crew it's funny how that you know when you go back to when we switched to divisional play I think a lot of people thought terminally perpetually other than the Cardinals maybe that that central division would always be a bunch of bad teams the Cubs will be bad the Reds will be bad the Pirates will be bad the Brewers will be bad well now as it turns out this might be the best division in baseball mm -hmm. yeah. with the Cubs and the Pirates and Cardinals ranked in a lot of people's top 10 overall. So no doubt that doesn't help the Reds as far as their total wins 
for the year, but I think they can avoid the basement. The interesting thing with the Reds, uh, early in the season, it appears at least attitudinally they're going about it the right way. I think they all understand the expectations are very low, but they don't look like a team that's out there saying, man, we stink. We're just going to go through the motions and see what happens. Uh, you know, how long that can hold on, who knows. But uh, all they got to do is escape the Brewers and they can finish fourth. I watched the Reds on Monday because, you know, the Indians get postponed. There was no Tigers game until Tuesday night. And it was, I'm sitting there watching it and I'm like, okay, who are these cats? <laughs> right. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm thinking to myself, I mean, I know who, the, I know who this guy, who is this? What is this guy doing up here? I think it's going to be a year of, you know, getting when you go to the ballpark down there, buy a program, get a roster card, you know, so you can compare names and numbers because it could be that type of season for the Reds. But if they, I mean, if they play somewhat consistent baseball, they can avoid the seller. I mean, at least based on the first two days of the year where Milwaukee has been like my garbage can that probably blew over on Wednesday in the rain and the wind. <laughs> yeah, Milwaukee. Well, before you get too excited over what the Reds did, remember they were playing yeah. Phillies. I was going to say. Also going to be one of the worst teams in baseball this year. But I think there's going to be some excitement with the Cincinnati team this season because unlike the last several years, we don't know what this Reds team is capable of. Let's, let's face it, last four or five years, we knew Cincinnati was going to contend. We knew the Reds had a good chance to get into the postseason, but we also knew they really weren't going to go very far in the postseason. We don't know anything about this Reds team outside of Joey Votto is going to be consistent. He's going to infuriate some fans, and he's going to deliver when he needs to. So I think the Reds are going to be a fun team to watch because there are so many unanswered questions. There are so many unknowns about this season that we'll learn something about the future for the Cincinnati Reds this year. And they've got a lot of guys that will be pitching for the big league club this year that have been <laughs> touted prospects, not only in their own organization, but others that will probably see the mound this year for Cincinnati, starting with Robert Stevenson on Thursday night, who's been long touted as the next great pitcher for the Reds through their own organization. So that's always exciting, too. Yeah, it's not always the... When the expectations aren't high for the season, it's nice to, to have the prospects come up, and it's a different type of ex excitement for the season, and I think right. that's what Reds fans are experiencing right now. Now, who is your surprise team in Major League Baseball this year? Who do you see making a run that maybe we didn't notice in the offseason? Well, that's a good question. I mean, there's been, to me, I think, I, I'm going to go in reverse. I think everybody's penciling in the Cubs. I still say it's the Cubs. I just don't think that they're automatically now the best team in baseball. Forget it, you know, mark it down, forget about it. They were great last year. They still lost in the playoffs. I don't know about the Cubs. I'm going in reverse with my surprise team. How about that? Well, I don't think, I don't think you can consider the Cubs just because of what their success a year ago, but a team that made a splash in free agency that I think could be a solid team coming out of the National League is Arizona. Ah, took mm -hmm. mine. You know, with, with Zach Greinke, I mean, you got the anchor of a staff right there, two hundred plus million dollars. I, I mean, I've always liked what Arizona has done for the most part. They've got a very great, great hitter in, in Paul Goldschmidt, um, who's an all-star first baseman as well. I like what the Diamondbacks have on paper through two days of the year. I'm liking what I'm seeing out of the Miami Marlins. The fact you've got D. Gore in the top of the order. Uh, a rare player who, you know, won a gold glove last year, was the silver a batting leader as well as the stolen base leader. He's your spark plug and get on base. He's extremely quick. If Stanton and Yelich can stay healthy, get some pa power in the middle of the order, and you've got Martin Prada, who is always a consistent bat as well. A couple of good arms for the, the Marlins as well. So I think Miami might be a team we're not necessarily talking about in the National League, but the fact that they're going to play the Braves a lot, the fact that they're going to play yeah. the Phillies a lot, I think the Marlins could be a team that could sneak in there and be a contender in the I, NL East. I think it's a good pick, too, because of the division. I think the NL East is certainly winnable for anybody that can put together a decent season, almost uh, the opposite of the NL Central. Uh, so you're right, the Marlins, and, the, and they do this. Like every eight, ten years, all of a sudden, yeah. oh, the Marlins are good again. <laughs> Well, that's because then they blow it all up and become awful again and build it back up. And they have someone in the dugout that is, you know, a legit manager and Don Mattingly. You know, you don't have the GM deciding, oh, I'm going to be the manager for the rest <laughs> of the year and doing the hokey pokey. And, you know, I'm interested to watch, uh, you know, they're hitting, you know, with Barry Bonds. Right. You know, a very in court well, of, sort of quiet they, hire that was. They guaranteed themselves that they have increased their warning track power. They made the warning tracks bigger yes. at Marlins Park. <laughs> and they brought in center field nine feet, too. It well, that's, that's more room for the statue to breathe. Right, yeah. yeah. 
I like that. Expand the warning track psychologically. Our guys will think they're hitting it farther, I guess. I don't know. Although that was a moonshot that Stan hit on the other night on yeah, Verlander. You don't need a warning it track. It doesn't matter no. how far the fences are. He can hit it almost you out of that, that ballpark. Right. Giancarlo. I was going to talk about Arizona, but since you did, I'll mention Houston, who is very young, and I think they are on a lot of people's radar. But, you know, Keiko started in the All-Star game last year. They've they made got, the playoffs last year, too. Right. Houston reminds me a little bit of the Pirates about four or five years ago where, you know, they had a great start last year. The Astros did kind of faded down the stretch, still made the postseason. But I, I think all the pieces are there for the Astros to, to really be a contending force. You know, they, they, they were so awful for so long, drafted very well, yeah. and we're seeing those high draft picks come through the system. Here's something to remember with Houston. Jose Altuve established All-Star at this point. He's still only like 25 years yeah. old. Yeah. Your veteran presence in that lineup is still a young guy. Yeah, should be interesting to see what Houston is able I to do I love Carlos this Correa, too, by and the he, way. Yeah, he's just fun to watch. I remember when Manny Machado came in for Baltimore, he reminds me of him. And those young guys, it, it's, it's a good time for the young guys in baseball. Let's talk hoops now. Uh, NBA playoffs around the corner. Cavs locking up that one seed. But will Tyrone Liu be back next season, or is this his only go as the Cavs head coach? I think it's TBD. I think it's going to be, be determined by what happens in the next six, seven weeks, whether or not they make it to the finals and whether they win the finals. I think that's going to be the ultimate test on Tyron. Not only that, what if the associate head coach, you know, the guy. He's not opting out. <laughs> Don't read the subtweets. Well, he was, he was coaching the other night or he last was. week ago, whenever. Heck, we haven't done this show in a month. I mean, I can't <laughs> remember the last time we talked about him. But it was one of those things where, you know, where he's up and he's behind, you know, the main boss, you know, directing traffic out on the floor. He could have been teed up. I don't know if Teron Liu will be back. I suspect that he will be. But uh, speaking of LeBron, uh, think about this. The, the window is closing on LeBron's greatness. Yes. I agree. If he's, they don't win it this year. He's got a lot of miles on those tires. Yeah. You could talk about him, him only being 31. Remember, he came into the league when he was 19, and yeah. he has played a lot of basketball, not only in postseason, but also Olympic basketball as well. So there is certainly not a lot of tread left on those tires. I really hope he doesn't play Rio for his sake, for, you know, to rest, you know, to take a summer, to rest and relax, you know, because it's been, he's had such a commitment to USA basketball, and I'm sure he would go down and watch the team and support him. But, I mean, that's just more mileage that he's got on his tires, like you said. I think the, the Cavaliers, it's important that they do it this year or next year because the level of LeBron is only going to get lower yep. from here as far as his overall athleticism and ability. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if they're going to do it this year. At times they seem like a hot mess. Other times they seem like they've got it figured out. We'll see. But I, I do think Tyron Lue will be back. Well, in the East, everyone likes the Cavs. In the West, the Warriors certainly are still the favorite. Do you think they'll break the Bulls 96 in 1996 when they won? I do not. I think, not I think they they're going to tie it. Minnesota the other night. Yeah, I think they're going to tie it. It's going to be 72 and 10. Well, they got what? Two games left with San Antonio. Two right. games left with Memphis. Yep. And you got to figure, <clears throat> one of those San Antonio games they'll they'll lose because somebody will rest, somebody won't rest. Or or will Pop you know, say these games don't matter and rest right. all of his starters? Yep. What well, will the Warriors maybe do that yeah. too? Although they've said 73 is a big deal for them. Maybe they'll reconsider if somebody tweaks a hammy or an ankle. You know, maybe somebody sits. So it's hard to look at it that far ahead. But I do think they're going to end up tied. I just it's the way it should be, I guess. In the United Center, there below the banner for that '96 team, there's a 72 and 10 yep. sign. I wonder if the Warriors break that if they take that down, or if it's they're just proud of the fact that they had their 72 wins, even though it won't be a record anymore. Well, you know what though, even if the Warriors go 73 and nine. 72 and 10 has got some symmetry to it, much like how Roger Maris hit 61 home runs in 1961. Yeah. That number is yeah. always going to re remind you of that. I think the fact that you only had 10 losses, the Bulls, back in the 96 season, I think that, that, that will always have some, a special meaning because it's just it's a nice round number. Right, and that number is retired in Chicago, too. So, I mean, with the day and age of guys wearing different and odd numbers in the NBA, nobody <laughs> will wear 72 in Chicago. That is part of the retirement of uh, numbers in yeah. the, at the United Center. Yeah, of it's a record the, that has stood for a long time. The beautiful years. thing about it is the Warriors could win 73 or 75. They can't get to that now, but it, none of it will matter if they don't win the championship. Right. Everybody will forget about it. Just like the Mariners in 2001. Yeah, who won 111, was it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the best season ever in baseball, but they lost in the playoffs. All right, great job, guys. Great to be back together talking sports on Press Row. Thank you for joining us this week. We'll see you right back here next week.